This is our last week in our study of Psalms. We've looked at all the various uh, types of songs in there and seen a real kind of organic gathering of songs. Some date back to a thousand years before the Second Temple. Others are very definitely written um, around the time the Persians allowed the Hebrews back after the Babylonian captivity. This week we're going to look at um, communal psalms of lament and thanksgiving as we wrap up our topic uh, survey of the various psalms. Now, one of the huge differences between communal and and personal lament, and there's a reason why the individual laments are a full third of, of what is in the Psalter. Community events are a far smaller number by that, um, almost a quarter of uh, compared to how many are there for the individual lament. Part of that is just the basic element of something individual versus something corporate. When it's an individual, a person has ownership of that. They come with their situation. Maybe it's to heal. Maybe it's um, uh, anger against a neighbor. Um, maybe it's something that they're ashamed that they had, have done. And when they approach, they approach. They're talking with the priest, it's assumed. But there's ownership. Their, their words, their solution, their expectation. Sure, in the in the personal Thanksgiving, they might celebrate with the entire community, but probably not. And we saw that in the numbers. There were weren't anywhere near as many individual Thanksgiving psalms as there were individual um, songs of lament and petition. The ownership is very much the person. The person only has to step up and be who they are, acknowledge what they want. When you get to communal stuff, however, we're talking an entire group of people. So that even if you and I don't necessarily agree 100%, in order to share the words of a communal lament, we both end up signing on to that. So in even if it's not our issue, we end up taking some kind of ownership of our anger, of our grief, of our frustration, of whatever it is that we want to aim at God. One of the uh, top Christian scholars in Hebrew scriptures points out that it's an act of bravery. Essentially, these psalms are communally telling God, you're not doing the job. You've got to step it up. You've got to make your promises. You've got to be better than you're being. That theme is not really found in individual psalms. Individual psalms are pleadings. But community songs, psalms can be quite um, anger-filled quite intense, and it's the entire community in the temple signing on to this, risking themselves in the face of God's potential wrath. Now, there's two things about that. First, that the Hebrew people had a covenantal relationship with God, which meant they were closer, it was more communal. Generally speaking, and we have to speak in generalities because while a lot of the Hebrew culture has been preserved, a lot of the worship culture around them has not been. So all of it is kind of our best guess unless we discover something really amazing. But generally speaking, the communities around them, the Persians, the Assyrians, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Romans, all of these people who at time, one time or another conquered uh, the Hebrew people, had pantheons of gods. We talked about this last week, that when they addressed in a personal lament, they first had to essentially kiss up to the entire pantheon and then zero in on the individual god they wanted to. Hebrews weren't, didn't have that. They didn't have the kiss up period. They zeroed in on God and said, oh, this is not, not right. I'm not healthy. Fix me. I'm not happy. Make this work. Someone else is telling lies about me. Fix it. For a corporate level, there is this, this sense of, of risk that what if this time God is just as punitive and judgmental as the gods in other worlds? The gods in other worlds were believed to see humans as playthings, as toys to, to fool around with. That is not the Hebrew understanding. And I, again, I do not want to get into us and they because we just don't have enough evidence and don't have enough knowledge of what the other worship practices really looked like on the ground. But the Hebrew practice talked to God as their friend, as their, their person they were responsible to, but who was also responsible to them. So we get some psalms where the language is really, really angry and really, really challenging. Other psalms that are like, you did this before, why aren't you doing this for us now? 
A good modern example, for those of you familiar with the musical Fiddler on the Roof, is the character of Tevya. He's the main character of the musical. And throughout the entire time, there's a dialogue between Tevya and God. And Tevya is asking God, you know, why did you make my horse lame? Why do I have five daughters? Why are we having to leave? How could you do this? And through it all, there's also the sense, oh, but you were wise, you were good, you know what you're doing. So he essentially is embodying through the entire musical what a, a lament looks like. That you can complain to God, but also thank God for the good things and recognize that God is has something bigger in mind. So that's the stage of the communal lament, is this risking brave people who stand up to God and say, not good enough. You've got to do better for us. That was the promise. So looking at a few of them more individually, um, we start off, the first community event is, uh, is number 12. And all I can hear is a group of old folks sitting around, nattering about the younger generation, how they are not getting it right. The term this generation is often heard throughout scripture and, and through time, in fact. Uh, elders complaining about the young ones. You know, not much has changed. Now, one of the interesting things about Psalm 12 is it talks about putting silver in the fire seven times. A number is never just a number in Hebrew scripture. It always has significance. And the number seven is the number of perfection, like seven days in the week. God rested on the seventh day because the world had been made. Perfection was made. So when you see the number seven, they're recognizing that in order for this generation to understand what's going on, they have to go through that purifying experience to understand, to be made whole and perfect, as the elders think they are. So there's a little bit of ego going on there. Um, moving on to number 44, it is a huge list of challenges to God. Like This is the ultimate example of a community lament where there's just endless. You were there for people in the past. You're not here for us. This is happening and this has happened and this is happening. Where are you? You promised and you're not being here. And the last section actually tells God, wake up and get on the job. Can you imagine? The challenge, what that must have heard, been heard when other peoples heard them talk to God like this. You just did not talk to the gods like this. But the Hebrew people did because they saw that partnership. They saw that connection. And when God was not doing God's part, you know, wake up. We're suffering here. Um, moving on to um, Psalm 50, 58, we have again a very huge list of violent expectations, violent desires. This gets back to the revenge fantasies that come up over and over and over again. This past Sunday, I was invited to speak about um, the revenge fantasies in the Hebrew scripture and how do we reconcile a God with so much violence with a God with so much love. Often when these Psalms are put in new Psalters, whether it's Jewish Psalters or Christian Psalters, a lot of the violent stuff, especially if it's a huge chunk towards the end, like this one in 58, is removed. So we're not actually rehearsing all the violent stuff. We're going to speak a little bit more about revenge fantasy at the end of this, but we cannot take away from the fact that these are oppressed people who can have all the fantasies that they want because they never got a chance to exercise any of them. This is just strictly a, a letting off of steam what they want to have happen. And Psalm 58 has a lot of that. Um, Psalm 85, we're looking, again, it's a very different tone. Yeah, there's, there's a complaint about what has happened, but there's also uh, an imaging of what restoration is going to look like, what God's intervention is going to look like. And there's an element of hope in this. So it's, it's a little bit different than the, than the generic uh, lamentation psalms. Um, uh, then we're look, moving on to uh, Psalm 106. Now, this is definitely a second temple psalm. And the quick and dirty way you can get that is, first of all, how long is it? Because the longer the psalms generally, and these are all generalizations, longer the psalms generally they're more recent in time. The shorter ones are further back in time. So that's first off how you can kind of assess. Secondly, the way you can assess is how in-depth 
this psalm is with the story of Moses. A lot of that wasn't even composed until the Babylonian exile. So for these people to be rehearsing that, that means it's after the Babylonian exile or after they're returned, because this is a second temple. So they're getting back some of their power by highlighting how God was active in the um, in the second temple period and how God was active in the time of Moses. Now another element of this is the huge sense of Hebrew purity going on. And this was very much in character with the second temple. One of the uh, places you can go look for it at its most atrocious is the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. In the very back of each book, there is a list of men's names and their wives not being Hebrew, and they're to leave their wives and their children behind as they return because there was only genuine Hebrew purity. Now, this would also be part of a response to what was going on in Galilee and um, Samaria, how they were Assyrian and Hebrew mixed together, and the pure, um, uh, well, call themselves pure. There never actually is uh, an ethnically pure Hebrew person because trace them far enough back, they're actually a bunch of nomads from a number of cultures that have come together. But in the Second Temple period, they consider themselves a pure ethnic group and they want to make sure that everybody is them. Those of you who are younger, it's kind of like Harry Potter, you know, the, the pure bloods and the mug bloods. Well, they considered the Samaritans and the Galileans as mud bloods or half bloods. They consider themselves the pure bloods, the genuine inheritors, the only ones that should matter. So that's going on. Scholars also think that the book of Ruth, the novel of Ruth, was written at this time period as a pushback to this ethnic cleansing almost that was going on um, in, uh, in the Second Temple and post-Babylonian exile Judah that if you look at the book of Ruth, of course, she is the mother of Obed, who is the father of um, Jesse, who's the father of David. So essentially, this novel sets up Ruth, a foreigner from Moab, to be the great-grandmother of the greatest king. And that's a, Ruth, of course, is part of the um, lineage. I believe it's in Matthew. Um, so this was considered a, a pushback to that desire to have this, this notion of pure Hebrew per people. Um, but this 106 Psalm definitely has that tone to it and that desire. And our last Psalm of, of, of community lament is 137. And if you grew up in the 70s and 80s, you would have heard Boney M's version of By the Rivers of Babylon. It's, it's still a wonderful reggae piece of music. Now they also, only keep to the beginning of it because the end of it is an, another example of revenge fantasy. This is definitely written during the Second Temple period because they're looking back on what's going on and they're, they're starting to gain their strength. This is not a psalm that can be written in the midst of that anguish. This is a psalm that's going to be written afterwards as we remembered. And Zion again, of course, not Jerusalem specific, but just the people of Judah people of Jerusalem, people involved in the temple, it's all kind of intermixed. There's no clear identity of what Zion is. And challenge any scholar, anybody who says that Zion is most definitely Jerusalem, because there's no clear link on that. Jerusalem is now a huge center, but back at that point in time, it wasn't that big a deal. And that's something that a lot of folks don't realize. Now, moving on to community uh, prayer, uh, Psalms of Thanksgiving. It's probably the most easily accessible uh, group of Psalms that we have. Now the difference between praise and community of Thanksgiving, because they could, both of them could go either way, the fine divide line seems to be, um, is a lament um, identified? Not, it's not a full lament, as we've just looked, but, but the problems were identified, and now God has fixed them, and that's where the thanksgiving is. That's where the praise is. Um, so praise is just straight-up praise. Thanksgiving has that element of things are bad, now they're great, and we're going to celebrate that. So that's really the, the um, uh, distinction between the two. Um, 107 is a full example of what a praise, uh, or a thanksgiving psalm is, rather. It lists a whole bunch of scenarios that were really bad, that people were struggling. And as you read them, they could be metaphor, they could be physical, they could be both. Just the way the psalmist has written them, you could be in chains physically or, 
or spiritually. You could be in the rough seas physically or spiritually. So it doesn't really distinguish and I really don't think it matters because the whole idea is you're separated from God and now you come back and then you are better because you are with God. Um, and a celebration of everything that God does for you. Um, Psalms 124 and 129 uh, are slightly different again. I mean, all of these are categories, so there's every psalm has their own nuance. Now, what's really interesting about these two is the second line in has the congregation responding. That's where we know it's a community uh, um, psalm for sure. And I can almost hear this, almost like, you know, if you've, you've seen TVs or shows or you've had the privilege of being at a, at a black Baptist church where uh, the pastor's talking and the congregation's kind of vocalizing back, I kind of think that's what's going on here. Because the congregation is responding, and at other times in the Psalter, the congregation has actual words to say, but this just says the congregation responds. So what kind of sound that is. Um, it could be a pat answer. It could be just instrumental. I, there's no way for us to know. But I just have that sense that it's kind of a, a guttural uh, approval sound, like you're going to hear in, in, in some of the Southern American churches when they're hearing something from the pastor that they agree with. Um, moving to Psalm 136. Uh, now this is a full little litany. This does actually give the congregation the words to respond. And every second line, not second verse, but within the verse, the couplet, has one line and then it responds. And the response the same throughout. And it's recounting the history of the Hebrew people. So again, we're probably looking at a second temple period piece because they include, um, include a lot of things that would have been banged out during the Babylonian exile, but not necessarily talked about prior to the Assyrian exile, which uh, the two do actually matter historically about what is is talked about and what is written down. So we have this beautiful litany, but the only one that um, that is in the Psalter, where the people have a definitive response every single time the leader says something. Um, and that's the, oh, that is, <laughs> look at my cheat sheets here, that is the last of the Thanksgiving um, community thanksgiving psalms. So we've looked at a, at a variety of psalms, praise, creation, king, reigning, laments, th and thanksgiving that are both communal and individual. And one of the themes, if there is a theme throughout all of this, of course, is the violence, the revenge fantasy. As I mentioned, I, I had an opportunity to speak to a, a couple of groups very recently about how we deal with that, how we respond to the revenge fantasy, how we try to reconcile that with the ideal of a God of love. So I was reading a little bit more into what some psychologists actually have to say about the whole notion of revenge fantasy. And they said that this is you not unique to any culture. It covers every culture in the world, every time period, everyone. It's, it's a human emotional response to injustice, and of injustice to self, injustice to community, is to have revenge fantasies, wanting to get back at whoever created this problem. And oftentimes they are not realized. They are most often um, a response of the person who does not have a lot of power. So the only thing they have is their fantasies. But those fantasies tend to go away if the person gets some power back. So I'm curious to see whether or not the whole act of including it in liturgy, of making it ownership, of, of getting God to do things to their enemies is actually a way of them communally dealing with their, their sense of, of revenge fantasies, the, the sense of getting back. Because anybody who spends any time with history knows it's one of those what goes around comes around kinds of, of enterprises. Every government topples. Every bully is taken down. Every monarch dies alone. Um, every bad person eventually gets their comeuppance. You wait out long enough, you can see it happen. And it's very easy to accredit that to God rather than just happenstance. So it might be these, these revenge fantasies within the songs of the Hebrew people might actually be a way for them in a healthy manner to work it out amongst themselves, to actually get some expression, to put all that revenge responsibility onto God's shoulders. So they are no longer the ones that have to act like that. 
Now, one of the other interesting things these psychologists identified is that revenge fantasies are almost exclusively from men. And I'm recognizing the binary here. We're not looking at, uh, at gender as a spectrum. We're looking at the binary. That men have revenge fantasies. Women tend not to. And any women who do indulge in revenge fantasies are seen as antisocial. Women tend to turn on themselves or they just let it go. Uh, the way that uh, women kind of see revenge fantasies um, or how they express it often is through low self-esteem. Had they continued to beat themselves down the way whoever um, their oppressor was started doing. Or they turn to suicide, which is, is a really sad thing, but it's the internalizing that women do. Men tend to go outward and act outward and be really loud and brash and demanding. And in a patriarchy, that behavior is rewarded as being just and right and the thing we're supposed to, that men are supposed to do. So the liturgy might be a way of containing that in the community, giving a healthy way for that to be expressed by both men and women, and then they can get it out of their systems and continue on. Now, that's my conclusion. Um, the investigation about the gendered uh, reaction to violent fantasies is, is kind of interesting, and, and a lot of psychologists kind of weighed in on the articles that I read. So it's not a, a, a light theory. It's out there. When it comes to the Hebrew world and revenge fantasies, however, no work has really been done. So all I can do is, is kind of guess at why they're so prevalent. The one thing we can know for sure, however, is that these are the people's fantasies. This is not God-driven. And it's really important that we draw the distinction between the people wanting revenge and God being of love. Just because they want God to do the work does not mean that is how God does do things. And we have to draw that as distinction pretty, pretty tightly because too many people who just read the Bible on the surface level and don't do any of this work that we're doing to understand what's going underneath, they think this represents what God actually did to people. And they don't have any concept that this is actually what people wanted God to do but never actually got realized because these people had no political power whatsoever. So on that note... We're concluding our study of Psalms. As I mentioned in the beginning, this is me learning with you along the way. This is not something I had done before. And I find it, it's amazingly fascinating how many different aspects of human nature we do find in Psalms. Um, Martin Luther, Calvin, we talked about that in week one, how they identify the Psalter as having all the emotions, how it's the summary of the Bible, everything just in one place. This is part of the reason why Hebrews or uh, Jews and Christians have been able to pray it for 2,000 years and why our Muslim siblings see this as an opportunity to have communion with us even though it's not something they would do themselves when they're they're worshiping alone. We see that their joy and sadness and fear and and political strife and and every imaginable human uh, feeling under the sun and they're life-giving and they're all open-ended that's the really interesting things the psalms never really conclude there's always room for us to kind of build into that and weigh into that and see what's going to happen when they rehearse history we can start adding our own history or or other history of the world to seeing where we think god intervened and where god didn't when we talk about sickness and and praise and, and leadership. We see that in our leaders today and we're asking that they have the same level of integrity that the Hebrews of centuries, millennia ago, wanted to see in their leaders. So it really invites us in to be part of it. We can pray the Psalter regularly and when we're in a mood we can now go thematically to the Psalms that might be able to express that for us and spend a little more time just kind of deep diving in that deep, that theological imagination, that spiritual and faith imagination that the Hebrew people had. We're quite fortunate in that they have done this work because now we don't have to express our own words unless we want to. We have someone else who has done it for us and those words have been spoken now by millions of people through two and three thousand years. They mean something. 
They are from the heart, whether we've composed them or not. So thank you for this journey. We're going to be starting uh, Holy Week on Sunday, so I invite you to join me every day from uh, Palm Sunday straight through to Easter Monday as we look at another reflection on Holy Week and what that means for us as people of faith.